morning. Please join me in this morning's responsive reading, which is printed in your order of service. <clears throat> Monsters come in all shapes and sizes. Some of them are things people are scared of. Some of them are things that look like things people used to be scared of a long time ago. Good morning once again and welcome to Fountain Street Church. My name is Carolyn Kempter Morrison and this is my spiritual home. I have been attending this church since before my birth. Ooh, I do have proof of this. Um, I have a picture of my parents uh, who were married right, right here, right on this spot in this chapel. There they are. That's my mom and dad, Sally and Paul. They're exiting this very aisle um, on October 20th, 1951, which was the day they were married here. And um, I am the apple that didn't fall very far from their tree because um, I do a lot of the same things that they used to do when they were still with us. Um, in fact, I, I live in their tree, which is the house where I grew up. Um, couldn't even leave that behind. So. Um, I'm very grateful to my mom and dad because they brought my brother and me here every week, week after week, year after year. And Jeffrey and I both agree that it was a real privilege to grow up in this religious community. Um, I have countless happy memories of this place and its many different spaces. Um, some of the more specific things I remember about this particular space um, Long time ago, the carpet was green, and then the carpet was orange, kind of rust-colored, and now it's green again. I, I love the green. I'm happy to see the green back. Um, I remember singing in here with the junior choir, and all the character school kids sat out in the audience, and I felt like a, I felt like a movie star. I felt like, wow, I'm like the grown-up choir. You know, it was really, really a cool thing to be able to do. Most of my memories of this space come from the years that I was in the Fountain Club because we used to have our business meetings in here. Um, and one of the silliest things I remember about this place is rolling underneath the pews from the front of the room to the back of the room and back to the front of the room again. This was BC before chairs. There were actual <laughs> pews in here not that long ago. Um, and we did this just because we could. And we also did it because we knew that nobody was going to yell at us. It was an okay thing to do that. And, and one of the people that we knew wasn't going to yell at us was Marty Childs. She was one of our adult leaders and she was wonderful and taught us how to be fearless and strong and roll to the back of the chapel if we, if we wanted to. <laughs> um, because the glory of growing up in this place was that there were, we were always encouraged to be ourselves. And so we did, and we thrived, and our minds were freed, and our souls grew. I even have later happy memories of this place, seeing some of my Fountain Club pals getting married in this space. Um, and uh, I have one sad memory of attending a memorial service for one of my Fountain Club friends in this space. Um, when our children were little, my husband and I, uh, faced the choice of moving to New York, where his job was going, or moving here, where neither one of us had a job. <laughs> and we chose to move here in, in no small part because we wanted our kids to grow up in this church. We've never regretted this choice. Their minds have been freed. Their souls have grown. And now they're busy working to change the world. So if you're new here, Please know that you are welcome. Whoever you are and whatever you think or believe or don't think or don't believe, we strive to be a house of prayer for all people. I lose some sales so my boss won't be happy, but I can't stop listening to the sound. Two soft voices 
blended in perfection from the reels of this record that I found. Every day there's a girl in the mirror asking me, what are you doing here? Finding all my previous motives, growing increasingly I've traveled far and I've burned all the bridges I believed as soon as I hit land. All the other options held before me would wither in the light of my plan. So I lose some sales so my boss won't be happy But there's only one thing on my mind Searching boxes underneath the counter On a chance that on a tape I'd find A song for someone who needs somewhere to long for homesick cause I no longer know Where home is Is it I can't tell if it's When we were young, we pledged allegiance Every morning of our lives The classroom rang with children's laughter Under teachers' watchful eyes We learned about the world around us At our desks and dinner time Reminded of the starving children we cleaned our plates with guilty minds stones in the road shone like diamonds in the dust then a voice called to us to make our way back as we 
raised each other home. Stones in the road.
was thinking, asking her to sing that song right before I have to get up and speak. <laughs> she's going away to college for the first time in three weeks, and she's going to be a grown-up now. Um, just before I launch into my talk, I want to express my profound thanks to Margie and Robin and Bruce and Lee and Isabel and Elizabeth for all your ministry this morning because it's, uh, can't do it without you. <laughs> so thank you. Um, I want to start today's presentation with an explainer and a disclaimer. <clears throat> First the explainer, and I hope this works. <laughs> Bingo! <laughs> You probably weren't expecting when you came in here this morning to be attending the, ch the church of Wayne and Garth, but um, in the late 80s and early 90s, Wayne and Garth were, uh, also known as Mike Myers and Dana Carvey, were a couple of heavy metal music worshipers who um, were a recurring skit on Saturday Night Live, and they became so popular that they eventually got their own movie franchise, and I love them. Um, I went to high school with people that they're a perfect, they're a perfect parody of the people I attended high school with. Um, they, they spoke with a distinctive lingo and they had some, some quirky little patterns of speech and one of these was this syntactical habit that they had of making a very positive statement and, and then immediately negating it by adding the word not after a very brief pause. Um, as in, gee Wayne, do you think we might win an Academy Award? Oh, yes, Garth, I'm sure we will. Not. <laughs> this is what inspired the title of my sermon, I'm Innocent Not. Um, I think it's good to credit your sources regardless of how goofy they are. <laughs> um, and now the disclaimer. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about myself today, uh, specifically about my experience of growing up and gradually losing what for me was the blissfulness of a largely carefree childhood. Um, and I want to fully acknowledge that the only reason that this experience was, was possible was because I was a white, middle-class American, had a heterosexual American, white, middle-class upbringing. <laughs> um, I wasn't born in the midst of a civil war. I didn't grow up in the inner city. I have never doubted, I never doubted that I would live past my 21st birthday, so all of these things are luxuries that were afforded to me accidentally, um, and I understand that I'm a lucky person in that regard. Nonetheless, it was painful to leave behind the innocence of childhood, and I'm grateful that this loss was gradual, but I also feel sad that we still live in a world where there are lots of things that I'd rather not know, but I have to anyway. And I hope that each of you will find something that you can relate to in these stories. And I also hope that maybe you'll laugh here and there because humor is the best possible adaptive response to all these terrible things that we have to go through life knowing. Um, onward. I don't know what mudra that is, but. <laughs> it's the happy baby mudra. Despite theological arguments to the contrary, I believe that we are born innocent. How could it be otherwise? We come into the world utterly helpless, no understanding nothing of how things work and depending entirely on our caregivers to keep us alive, let alone comfortable. Unlike some, I was fortunate to be born to a couple of very capable caregivers who made every effort to protect and nurture me, and I was able to grow into a healthy young child. And I had belliers. <laughs> belliers was my constant childhood companion and nighttime protector. I felt incredibly safe when I was little. My parents protected me from knowledge of aspects of the world that would have frightened me terribly. I grew into my preschool years, believing the world to be a benevolent place. I was innocent. I remember riding home from various places at night in the back seat of the car and looking into people's lighted windows as we drove past their houses 
And just assuming that everyone, every one of those houses contained a family as happy and well-adjusted as mine was, um, it never occurred to me that there might be people in those houses who were hungry or depressed or abused or suicidal or any of that. <laughs> Some of the blessings and curses of living in one's childhood home are the relics that turn up when you go digging around in old drawers and closets. Um, I think this picture is really emblematic of my brothers in my 1960s cocktail culture childhood. <laughs> it must have been taken at a family party. I want you to notice my mom's gold lame apron. <laughs> and of course, the abundance of booze. <laughs> there were so many bottles that some of them had to be stored on the floor. <laughs> it was a fun life. The adults around us were often in a state of chemically induced joviality. <laughs> and I, I remember enjoying the nicotine soaked smell of the house the morning after a family birthday party or one of my mom's bridge parties. Jeffrey and I would go from card table to card table and snarf down all the little tidbits of bridge mix that were left over. We didn't know that alcohol and cigarettes were addictive, nor did we know that they caused horrible dread diseases. And like the little girl in the song that Isabel just sang, we enjoyed the spectacle of the adult world. We looked up in awe at those grown-ups and thought them invulnerable. But then we discovered that they weren't. This picture was taken around the time that Uncle Dinny, our mom's brother, was killed in a car crash, leaving behind his wife, our Aunt Betsy, and their two daughters, our cousins, Susan and Anne. It was Christmas time, and I was three and a half years old. And I don't remember my parents' reaction to this at all. I don't remember being told. I remember my uncle, and I remember him not being there anymore, but, our mother was a careful documenter of things. A few years ago, I found this piece of paper in a drawer. It is dated 12 24 64, less than two weeks after my uncle's death. And in my mom's handwriting, it says that this is how I reacted to her when she told me to hurry to bed because tomorrow is Christmas and Betsy and Susan and Ann will be coming. Apparently, I said, Denny's dead, isn't he? Your brother is dead. I just wish he wasn't, because that's all there is, just Betsy and Susan and Ann. <laughs> I don't know what a developmental psychologist would say about this, but I've always found it curious that I don't remember it at all. And I'm grateful to my mom for writing it down. You can kind of hear my mind processing the information as I'm speaking. I do recall another incident from about six months later. My mom and I were so excited about the glorious blooming flowers that had come up in our front garden. Um, and then some neighbor kids came by and picked most of them. I was outraged and horrified and I sobbed. I was so upset. And I remember all those things vividly, but I don't remember saying this, which I found on another piece of paper, thanks to my mom. <laughs> uh, it's too bad that God made those people because they're little rats, because they pick our flowers. <laughs> I was four and I was mad and I wasn't mincing words. <laughs> I was starting to, to understand that the world was not necessarily the friendly, friendly place that I had thought it was. Other real, realizations followed this one. I was greatly dismayed to discover that there were mean children in the neighborhood who would gleefully steal the bulbs out of the string of Christmas lights that my mom and I had strung with care on the tree in the front yard. Um, Thanks to an ad campaign on TV, I became convinced that littering was the eighth deadly sin. <laughs> and in 
And like many children, I misunderstood the stranger danger talk that we had in kindergarten. Um, I remember bursting through the back door of our house on that day and announcing very soberly to my mom, beware mom, there's a stranger on the loose. <laughs> I said these things. I remember that one. Um, as children, our brains are unburdened with the heaviness of the world. The adults carry it for us at first, but they gradually begin handing it over to us, ideally on an as-needed basis. As this process unfolds, we gradually leave the fairyland of childhood behind us. You could say that we become disenchanted, and I think that's an apt description because once we are aware of the world's darker side, we can't go back there to that enchanted world. In a book called Jumping Off Swings by Joanna Knowles, one of the characters describes this feeling of not being able to go back, saying, I'm lying in my room listening to the birds outside. I used to think they sang because they were happy, but then I learned on a nature show <sighs> that they're really showing off, trying to lure in some other bird so they can mate with it, or let the other birds know not to get too close to their turf. I wish I never watched that show, because now all I think about is what those pretty sounds mean and how they're not pretty at all. As a child, I loved animals, plush ones and real ones. I sensed that there was something reliable and pure and trustworthy about them, but even they ended up betraying my trust. <clears throat> On a family outing to the John Ball Park Zoo one cold afternoon in March, I wore my new store-bought set of matching hat and mittens. I was feeling really fancy because our mom used to knit most of our mittens and so these store-bought mittens were a real novelty. I got some of those deer kibbles they used to have by the, by the deer enclosure there and um, I put the kibbles on my hand, and I stuck it through the chain link fence. And a deer came over and ate the kibbles off of my mittened hand. I was delighted until, as I watched in abject horror, the deer finished the kibbles and proceeded to eat the brand new fancy store-bought mitten right off of my hand. I screamed and I sobbed, but there was just nothing anybody could do about this. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the rest of the people in my family were at least as amused as they were disturbed by this. <laughs> but it took years before I was able to see the humor in this situation. <laughs> this was a turning point for me as funny as it is, I think it was the moment that I really began to lose the firm grip I had thus far held on my belief that the world was a safe, fun place to be. It was a larger step than I had wanted to take at that age down the path towards adulthood. When I was six or seven, our mom took us to see The Sound of Music at the movie theater. And this was my first introduction to the term Nazi. The Sound of Music has been criticized for its sentimental G-rated treatment of a grave subject matter. Remember Herr Zeller and his annoying band of Nazis? I am personally grateful that this was my first impression of Nazis. I got the message that they were bad, mean people, but at six or seven I wasn't ready for the whole truth. That truth came later with the diary of Anne Frank and the increasingly detailed history lessons. I did get confused when not long after The Sound of Music, Mom took us to see Oliver, the musical adaptation of uh, Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, and I encountered the, the character of Nancy, as portrayed by Shani Wallace. Given that Nancy and her com companions were Cockneys, they all pronounced her name Nazi. <laughs> and I, re I remember thinking, 
she's so nice to Oliver and the Artful Dodger, why do they keep calling her a Nazi? I didn't get it. <laughs> when I was 10, I happened to see a trailer for the movie The Andromeda Strain, um, which is based on Michael Crichton's 1969 novel. Um, I didn't really understand what I'd seen, but it, it, it did succeed in scaring me, and so I asked my mom, what is that movie about? I don't remember exactly what she said, but I do remember what I heard. <clears throat> And it was this. Oh, that's about a capsule that comes to Earth from outer space. And a scientist opens up the capsule in a lab and releases something into the air that kills everyone in the entire surrounding city. OK, darling, now go to bed. <laughs> I did as I was told, clinging to bell ears for dear life. When my mom came in an hour later and found me still wide awake, she tried to reassure me, but I was inconsolable. I was sure that there was a white-coated scientist in a lab somewhere in downtown Grand Rapids who was about to open a capsule from outer space and that in a matter of seconds, I and everyone I knew and loved would be dead. When children get scared, they often ask us, their adult role models, for help. They say, what if this happens to me? And we say things like, oh, it's just a story, or that's extremely unlikely. I never found such statements reassuring because whatever the nature of the menace that I was dreading, the louder voices inside my head were saying, this is exactly what's going to happen, and you're exactly who it's going to happen to. Granted, I was more scarable than the average child, Ask my brother. <laughs> I'll spare you the story of my reaction at the tender age of 14 to the movie Jaws. <clears throat> <laughs> or maybe I can tell you. <laughs> I think Steven Spielberg would be really pleased to know that for months after seeing Jaws, I was afraid to go swimming. and. I'm not just talking about swimming in the ocean or even in Lake Michigan. I was afraid to swim in pools. <laughs> I was sure that somewhere in those chlorinated waters that I couldn't see from the surface, there was a shark just waiting for me to come in. I, I was even scared to put my feet all the way down to the bottom of my bed at night because I was sure that a shark was lurking there. And I was 14. <laughs> I was old enough to know better, but I wasn't old enough to feel better. Let's get rid of that shark. <clears throat> As I said, I'm grateful that my awareness of the sinister aspects of the world was mostly a gradual acceleration, starting with mildly disturbing and progressing, not always evenly, towards the truly horrific. For years, we saw the Vietnam War every night on the TV news. We saw the Memphis balcony where Martin Luther King was assassinated. We watched Bobby Kennedy dying on the floor of the Ambassador Hotel. The Kent State shootings happened. Planes crashed. Cult suicides were carried out. And Three Mile Island scared everyone. But it was after I graduated from college that a moment arrived when I finally felt like I had reached the point of no return. <clears throat> While a student at the University of Michigan, I became involved in Latin American politics. After graduation, I was accepted into a Spanish immersion program in Esteli, Nicaragua. This was in the mid-80s. Um, people can go to Cancun to learn Spanish, but I chose to do so in a country where the United States government was funding an insurgency. Um, Nicaragua in the mid-80s was a place where many children were being forced by everyday realities to grow up too fast. That's one of my neighbors um, in, in the town where I lived. The, the U.S. government was funding the Contras, as they were known, because it didn't like the left-wing politics of the Sandinista government. It will not surprise you to hear that this Spanish school had a political agenda. 
which was to convince people from the U.S. and other countries that the U.S. government should leave the Sandinistas alone and allow the Nicaraguan citizens to determine their own future. It was expected that graduates of this program would return to their homes and become, or continue to be, political activists and agitators and work to convince other people of this. While I tested into the second highest level Spanish class at the school, I was definitely a political novice in a group of much more seasoned political activists. In my Spanish class, I became friends with Matthew, or Mateo as we called him, who was also a political novice. He and I bonded over the fact that we were somewhat intimidated by our activist peers. We referred to ourselves as political babies. All of our class discussions were conducted in Spanish and we spent a lot of time talking about U.S.-Nicaraguan relations. Because I was still in my political babyhood, I had an overly optimistic view of what we were going to accomplish through our activism. I wasn't completely starry-eyed, but I did sort of hope that we'd return from our experience and work at explaining to our fellow Americans that what was wrong with fomenting a conflict in a place where we had no business doing so, and that they'd eventually become convinced and policies would change and our work would be done. <laughs> our classmate Ramona had a different perspective. Ramona had been engaged in political activism and social justice work for many, many years. During one class discussion, she kept insisting that ours was only one struggle amongst thousands around the world, that our work would never be done. Ramona said that standing up and resisting injustice in all its forms was essential. She said that it didn't matter if we were never successful as long as we kept on struggling against tyranny and oppression everywhere. She continued by insisting that we had to spend the rest of our lives fighting injustice, regardless of whether we succeeded in changing a thing. We had to keep fighting so that someday, long after we were dead, the world would be a better place for our distant descendants. She was right, of course. I'm going to spare you a list of all the reasons why our work is still not done. You know what they are. But I didn't want to hear this. I wanted to get up and run out of the room with my hands over my ears. I looked at Matteo and I could see by the look in his eyes that he was having a very similar reaction to this discussion. But we didn't succumb to that impulse. We did the grown-up thing and stayed in the room and participated in the discussion. This was another turning point. It wasn't as if Ramona flipped a switch and I was suddenly transformed, but I was all at once feeling the weight of adulthood in a way that I never had before. But like Carly Simon and Neil Gaiman's grown-ups, I felt older and taller on the outside, but no better equipped to deal with it on the inside. Quite a few steps further down the grown-up path, Bruce and I had our own children. And like us, they were born innocent, and we did everything we could to give them that same sense that we had of living in a benevolent world where they could grow and explore. It's hard to know what to let them know and when, and at some point you realize, especially when they go off to school, that they're going to experience a lot of those unpleasant awakenings without you there to hold their hand. You can't protect them from everything, nor should you. When she was pretty young, Lee experienced her first yellow jacket sting. In the midst of her sobs, she said, please kiss it. <laughs> it was heart-wrenching, knowing that she believed that this would stop the intense pain when I knew that it wouldn't. Then there was the time that Isabel lost a pair of tiny purple mittens right here in this church, and she sobbed for hours. Admittedly, this pushed some of my personal buttons because it was being about the loss of mittens. <laughs> being a parent has without question been the most joyous experience of my life. It takes a lot of grown-up chops, though, to do it well. I'm mostly comfortable now in my grown-up shoes, but 
Maybe this is another side effect of living in my childhood home, but I think I spend more time than the average person thinking and reminiscing about my childhood. I think we all occasionally long for that sense of benevolence and excitement and potential that we used to feel before the world got so real. I can catch glimpses of it when I stroll through the neighborhood at Halloween or when I see a mouse trap game and a Cub Scout cap from the 1960s in the back of my closet. I want to go back there. It was fun. It was fun not knowing all that stuff. But I'm a grown up now. And I know that one of the bittersweet things about being a grown up is that we can never really feel that safe again. We know too much. I'd like to leave you today with two things that I hope will cause you to smile because remember, humor is our best defense. The first, uh, first one is from Bill Watterson's Calvin and Hobbes. I'll read it to you in case you can't see it. Calvin's mom says, are you still awake too? And his, his dad says, mm-hmm, I was thinking. It's funny, when I was a kid, I thought grown-ups never worried about anything. I trusted my parents to take care of everything, and it never occurred to me that they might not know how. I figured that once you grew up, you automatically knew what to do in any given scenario. I don't think I'd have been in such a hurry to reach adulthood if I'd known the whole thing was going to be ad-libbed. <laughs> and then I have a slightly adulterated version of the familiar passage from 1 Corinthians. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when chronological age combined forces with the uninvited knowledge of less pleasant aspects of the world to compel me to become a grown-up, I put away childish things. Not 